Welcome to this episode of Let's Talk, where we zoom in on the practical implications of our Congress session on treatment concepts in the anterior region, specifically the long-term aesthetics. My name is Garrett Heikoop, and I'm very happy and proud to be joined by our two expert speakers on stage in that session, Stefano Grassis from Italy. Stefano, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are a private practitioner, a teacher, even the past president of the European Academy, Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. Um, and uh, your, your professional perspective is mainly as a prosthodontist. That's right. Which makes total sense in this session. Also joined uh, here with us today is Henny Meyer from the Netherlands. Henny, welcome. Thank you. You are a professor in implant prosthodontics at the University of Groningen. Both of you delivered a talk in a session which I invite our viewers all to check out. But right now, I want to start with the basics. We talk about the interior zone, the aesthetic zone, the Champions League of implant dentistry, right? And then we add to it long-term considerations. What's the main challenge in the long term when we look at implants in the uh, aesthetic zone? Should I start? Yeah, please. please okay. Well, the... Long-term perspective is that of having an aesthetically uh, successful restoration that remains stable over time, where the tissues around this restoration remain stable over time. So nowadays, we need to acquire the knowledge to understand what are the basis to place an implant in such a way that once the restoration is applied to it, then uh, these tissues will not recede we not lose volume. Not at all, because I, I believe we know that when you place an implant, there's always some bone resorption, and some soft tissue resorption. Well, you know, uh, there is a difference between bone resorption and bone remodeling. Uh -huh. Okay, and there is a, you know, a very fine difference there. Let's say that if we are placing an implant properly mm -hmm. in a healthy environment where there is a good plaque control, you may expect some bone remodeling, ah. but you should not expect bone resorption. Bone resorption, at least the way I interpret it, is due to the response, body response, to an inflammatory situation. Exactly. And if there is an inflammatory situation, then we need to understand why there is this inflammatory situation. Exactly. So you say stability, especially of the aesthetics over a long time. Henny, you had the privilege to present us new research yeah. here at the Congress in Berlin. There was also a big factor on stability. What have you seen in your long term? How, what term were you uh, studying in the study results you presented? Well, yeah, we presented the 10 year results and it's rather long in implant dentistry. Yeah, because um, it's a relative young field. Yeah, that and because we are, it's a dynamic situation we have with evolving uh, implant designs, in, uh, evolving uh, procedures. And we uh, actually we had uh, a protocol from more than 10 years ago when we started this study. And it was just nice to see that we had such stable um, results. And I totally agree with you, uh, Stefano. Today we're looking for no bone loss anymore, no recession of mucosa anymore. Uh, if we follow the right procedures with the right materials, um, you can perform a treatment result which is going to be very stable. So we have to be sure that the initial result is good. Exactly, because that's what you showed in the talk. Stability, you were quite surprised. Stefano, when you were watching those results, what was your first thought? They were not surprising, I would say. To you, they were not that surprising? No, because that they really um, uh, match my personal experience with these type of solutions. Again, if you do proper treatment planning mm -hmm. and you identify the site where you're placing the implant and you make sure that you have the right volume of bone and therefore of soft tissue on top of it. Then you place the implant and you do what you're expected to do in the fabrication process of this restoration. And you ensure that there is a good stability of the restoration onto the implant, which means applying proper torque, having therefore the proper um, uh, preload. Then at that point, I would say that this is really the outcome that we regularly see. Yeah. But of course, let's keep in mind, we need to follow the patients. We need to make sure that uh, there is good hygiene control. Otherwise, then it's a different story. But Stefano, this sounds a little bit like if you follow the textbook and the manual well, you get the proper result. Of course, that's why it's the textbook. However, uh, reality might be uh, a lot more complicated. What do you hope that the clinical 
impact of your talks here today will be? What do you hope people watching that talk will change in their practice tomorrow? Well, um, let's say that I hope they understand the difficulty mm -hmm. of addressing a missing anterior tooth. And if your goal is to um, uh, fabricate a naturally looking restoration that does not stand out of the mouth, but fits into the mouth, then uh, there is no question. You need to understand these things. You need to provide the proper stage for that. So for anterior restorations, you need more planning. You need to realize ahead of time before doing the surgery how much volume you have and how you have to correct the eventual defect. And then uh, you need to uh, follow the guidelines as far as uh, placing a restoration, the time of healing of the tissues, the role of the materials. We did not really talk about that much, but again, having materials that are tissue friendly, like zirconia certainly can help. I've had very good outcomes also with uh, other types of ceramics uh, and with metal, but there is no question that, that the evidence is that zirconia may be more tissue friendly, but it is not just the material or the protocol, it's a combination of factors that really makes the outcome successful. Yeah, so that's why you iterate again, dealing in the interior and in, in the aesthetic zone, follow very considerately the textbook, devote more time to planning and make sure you know what you're doing, do it carefully. That's your key message there. Yes, it is. Henny, you presented a study on a more perhaps complex case yeah. when you are replacing two adjacent teeth or at least placing two adjacent implants. What do you hope people take away into their practice from that, those results? Um, ne next to the guidelines, I would say um, it, it's complex because it's about bone augmentation procedure, uh, uh, exact planning. Um, it's the aesthetic zone, so you have to be care carefully. Please, if they take home that they follow the right guidelines as we presented, because mm -hmm. our guidelines are evidence-based and not what we heard last week or what we are thinking about. They are all always uh, evidence-based. If they follow that guidelines, they can start doing that. But no... no. Do we, do we understand? Because you're both saying... EAO is about science. We provide science-based protocols. Please follow the guidelines. Yeah. However, you've also shared with me before, Stefano, in your practice also, you see a lot of work from other colleagues you have that have to be corrected. I bet at the university hospital you come across that as yes. well. Why are things going, let's not say wrong, but different? What, what is the reason that not everybody is following the protocol as supposed to? You know, again, uh, nowadays, uh, it may be due to the fact that people would like to do certain treatments more quickly. Mm -hmm. Is it they are not the patient. immediate error that yeah. Henny was referring to? Yeah, you know, so they, are tr they maybe attempt several procedures, one on top of the other, and therefore the risk of failure, to me, it increases. So with these type of restorations, you need to be patient. You need to do really one step at a time. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue probably, I uh, go back to the same story, they have not done their homework beforehand and they exactly. did not realize exactly what was the, uh, the site uh, uh, from the volume perspective of bone and soft tissue and maybe they underestimated that. Or they did not really understand that this is a prosthetically driven procedure. So you first need to understand where the tooth goes and then estimate whether you have enough volume underneath it to place the implant and restore that tooth in, in a perfect way. You say a prosthetically driven procedure, talking to two prosthodontists. How is that different from, like, uh, how would someone else start? From a surgical perspective or from, from a, a... surgical perspective, very often I've met uh, surgeons that would uh, underestimate uh, the consequences of placing an implant in a situation where there is a certain amount of collapse, uh, buccolingual, they still have enough volume to place an implant inside the bone, mm -hmm. but they do not realize that this places us in a situation whereby then creating an illusion of a natural tooth becomes a, a very uphill road. So uh, it's so not a matter of just... Integral approach. Yeah, it has to be. 
the, what I've tried to do today is also show the surgeons what are the challenges and the difficulties that we face when we have implants placed in less than ideal situation, especially when they are very inclined to the buckle. This provides really a very difficult setup for us with our components where we want to obtain aesthetics, but we need to guarantee also resistance to the forces applied to this restoration over the years. So is this then a, a matter of case selection? Perhaps sure. some cases Everything. should not be eligible for implants? This is what I, this yeah, is what I say. It's, I, I would like to say I'm, we are not against new protocols. Uh, if, we are only, if everybody's following the textbook, we are not getting ahead. Right. But please be sure if you are not that skillful or you do not have years of experience, stick to the textbook and let the new ways, new methods, let it be tried by skillful people, uh, universities, In and the university. they will try it. Uh, they will write manuscripts on it, if it's a good idea or not. Don't try it just at home because you have heard some new idea. Let it be done by skillful people uh, who, who have a, a lot of experience and have some background uh, not falling at every pitfall. Exactly. So, so this is a pledge for proper education and yeah. allowing yourself a learning curve. Yes, sure. And it requires, I guess, also to be able, that's why I refer to case selection, to in the chair be able to say, well, maybe I should pass you on either to a medical hospital or... or, or it's a difficult choice, I think. Yeah, but you know, what I've learned over the years is to do less implants in the aesthetic area. I can... In uh, general. Well, in so general, what, so do you send the patient away or no, do you have no, other solutions? No, no, no. Nowadays, we have still very conservative, conservative solutions, prosthetic solutions. So single wing adhesive bridges, all ceramic adhesive bridges, that give a very, very satisfactory clinical performance for many, many years. It buys time. It's less invasive, less costly. Um, and it, it is satisfactory both from an aesthetic and a functional point of view. There is no obligation to replace a missing tooth in the anterior at least uh, with an implant. Immediately with an... Uh, I, I want to add that we are, we are thinking that we are talking about the macilla, but with the, um, the small uh, uh, adhesive bridges, especially in the lower jaw, which is also the aesthetic region, they are very useful because most of the time, we don't have the space for an implant. Exactly. Yeah, we, didn't show, uh, we didn't show any inferior cases yeah. because they are so difficult to do. Absolutely. So, but then, Henny, help me understand, because just before on stage, I hear you say, I don't like the bridges. Yeah, we, bridges on two pillars. Uh, you, you're talking about, about ah, adhesive people. bridges. I'm not so in favor of adhesive bridges in the maxilla because usually you have enough time for an implant. And I'm the guy, if you're putting a root out, putting in an implant, if there's enough space. If you are in doubt, an adhesive bridge is an absolute good solution. Exactly. In your talk, you also showed results on another option uh, to reduce the number of implants, and that's working with a cantilever. Yeah. What is the most important thing that you would like to tease our viewers with to go check out your talk? What, what is the key finding there? The, the key finding there is that the, uh, the uh, patient satisfaction and clinical outcome is absolutely the same as two implants. So when you are in doubt placing two implants or one with a cantilever, and if there is not enough space, please think of a cantilever crown. Exactly. I think it's the, it's the best solution. Because implants uh, need some bone to be the, 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 the bone around them, if it's too, too near to another implant or too natural root, it will not survive because it needs blood. And if there's too little space for an implant between two implants, the bone will not survive and you don't have papilla. Exactly. Speaking about papilla, one last thing I'd like to highlight from your session. There was an, uh, uh, seemed to be a clear difference between how patients yeah. value the results of the outcome, especially in the long term, and how dentists yeah. scientifically classify the outcome. <laughs> Stefano, you, you heard the results. Patients seem to be much more happier than the dentist on certain well, cases. It, it is true to some extent. Depends on the patient. Uh, I have patients who absolutely are less picky than I am. Other patients were instead, uh, you know, that last uh, little detail does make a difference. Yeah. But generally speaking, it is a true yeah. statement that I can uh, marry and I can... Any, any, why do you think that is? Because the key, key result you showed, 
Patient satisfaction was through the roof, while on a pink aesthetic score or on the uh, yeah. uh, the papilla score, You're right. with relatively low. Yeah, I think the other uh, factors are important for patients. They are coming out of a situation. Sometimes, if they're young, they are losing their teeth, and at a young at a young age, and they have to wait for several years. And then, at 18 or 20 years, they finally become the implants, and they are very happy with it. But Talking about single implants, beware of those patients who are already pointing out the papilla with their natural tooth and hoping that it comes okay. But why, why th these are that? the patients you have to be um, yeah. take care of because that's going to be difficult. Yeah. And possibly then they are on the, at the other end of the situation. You are happy, but the patient is not. But I presented mean values. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in for mean values, patients are not that well, I would say uh, uh, are very, very satisfied. And we, well, we must be worried about the, the, the aesthetic outcome because it's our job. Sometimes we raise the expectations of the sure, patient why not? too much. And so it's yeah. like a boomerang and you yeah. know, it comes but, back to us. Yeah. You, 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 know, you need to play it down a little bit. Yeah, but if be, you raise the bar too much... Uh, yeah, so, but be glad that it's not that. the other way around, that we are always happy and the patients are not. No, that's no. true, that's true. It's a good position to be in. Well, thank you both for sharing your lectures, your extensive science. I invite you to go check out the recording of the lecture on the online platform. Session is chaired by Arndt Happe and Irena Saylor. Very insightful and very based in science. Thank you both, and I'm looking forward to see you in the next video.